When you dive into the day-to-day -day realities of World War II field life, you start to appreciate that the cleverest innovations weren't always found in laboratories or command tents. Some of the most effective solutions, honestly, came from soldiers who were simply tired of roasting in their canvas shelters during the peak of summer. Before fans, generators and portable air conditioning units were even a fantasy. Troops figured out how to manipulate airflow so well that interior tent temperatures dropped dramatically. This wasn't theory. It was field-tested survival engineering born from discomfort, exhaustion and necessity. And the best thing about it is that the system still works today. Whether you're deep in the wilderness, setting up a reenactment camp, or just trying to create a cooler micro-environment for summer outings. Today, we're going to break down exactly how wartime units achieve this cooling effect, how you can rebuild the setup with simple tools, and what kind of temperature changes you should expect. It's one of those forgotten techniques that really makes you appreciate not just military history, but the ingenuity of people who had nothing but canvas, shovels, and practical knowledge. The method worked because soldiers learned to control air pressure rather than fight the heat. World War II armies quickly discovered that fighting heat directly was pointless. Canvas traps warmth, still air suffocates, and sun exposure turns a tent into a slow cooker. The solution wasn't insulation, it was pressure management. Troops realised that if they could create a low-pressure zone on one side of a tent and a high-pressure feed on the other, airflow would move continuously without the need for electricity. The technique depended on two simple actions. Adjusting tent flaps to create directional flow and digging shallow trenches to guide cool air underneath the canvas walls. These trenches weren't decorative or for drainage. They were functional air channels. Cooler air from shaded ground was pulled through the trench, up under the lifted canvas edge and across the living space before exiting through an elevated flap on the opposite side. The result was a steady cross-ventilation stream that moved heat up and out, making a surprisingly large difference in comfort. The flap system is one of the most overlooked components. Troops didn't randomly tie flaps open. They calculated how much lift and angle they needed, depending on wind direction. In a typical A-frame or command tent, they would open the incoming side about half height, just enough to create a throat that pulled in cool air. The outgoing side, however, was lifted much higher, sometimes full height, to act as an escape vent. Because hot air rises, this upper vent reliably became the high-pressure exit point. The airflow had no choice but to move forward, crossing the entire tent. When soldiers set the angles properly, the difference was dramatic. Veterans' accounts mention temperature drops of 5 to 10 degrees Celsius in otherwise stifling summer heat. For a setup made entirely of canvas and rope, that's significant. For your own outdoor camp, reenactment tent, or bushcraft shelter, the principle hasn't changed. Set your intake flap low. Set your exhaust flap high. If the flaps control direction, the trenches control temperature. By the time soldiers realised how well-shaded soil cooled air, trench channels became standard practice in many summer encampments. They dug narrow ditches, usually about a forearm deep, 
from the coolest shaded area into the base of the tent. Ground temperature stays lower than air temperature, and that difference creates a cooling effect. You can replicate this with modern gear even more efficiently. If you're camping, dig a trench starting from the most shaded point near your shelter. Keep it narrow so the air is forced to move. Then lift the canvas edge slightly above the trench mouth. If you want to increase the effect, you can line part of the trench with damp cloth or even pour a small amount of water on the soil. Evaporative cooling wasn't always used in the Second World War, but it was, you know, certainly known, and it really boosts the cooling significantly when done in dry climates. To test this Second World War technique, just set up a standard canvas tent or even a heavy tarp shelter. Record the interior temperature before you begin. Then open the flaps using the same low intake, high exhaust configuration. After airflow stabilizes, check the temperature again. Finally, add the trench and allow, oh, 10 to 15 minutes for the system to start cycling air. Under summer conditions, you should see a drop of several degrees, especially if the tent had been stagnant beforehand. What you're doing is essentially harnessing natural convection and ground temperature cooling, exactly what troops relied on when fighting heat was a matter of endurance. Even if you're not using a World War II-style canvas tent, the principle applies to almost any shelter. With a tarp set up, lift the windward edge slightly while raising the opposite rear edge much higher. Dig a short trench beneath the low edge to feed cool ground air upward. In a makeshift debris shelter, shape your entrance low and create an elevated rear vent using branches or a cut in the debris layer. The method even works with modern nylon tents if you manipulate the rain fly into a high-low orientation and allow the ground-level air to circulate. You're not relying on materials, you're relying on air physics. World War II soldiers weren't trying to innovate, they were trying to survive, and that forced them to develop systems that still outperform many modern techniques because they use nature instead of fighting it. If you found this breakdown useful and you want more authentic field knowledge, forgotten military methods and tested survival engineering, make sure you subscribe to Warfield Survival and share this video with someone who appreciates real historical insight.